you all for coming tonight. Um, this is really exciting that we're having this event. As Jane mentioned, it is our great new books in the humanities, and we have this event every month. And tonight, as you heard, this is the book, Picking Up, uh, Robin Nagel's book about the Department of Sanitation, on display here and on sale in the lobby as well. Um, I, I really want to start out just by introducing our panelists. We're going to have kind of an informal evening, no formal presentations tonight, and so I thought I would go right ahead with introducing both of the panelists. Um, we're very honored to have Commissioner Doherty here with us tonight. John Doherty is a long-time veteran of the Department of Sanitation. He began his career with that department in 1960. Is it okay for me to say that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was very young. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Within the department, he advanced very quickly to hold various key positions. He served as the department's 40th commissioner uh, from 94 to 98, and he became the 42nd commissioner in February uh, of 2002. He's born and raised in Staten Island, and he's the fifth person in the Department of Sanitation's history to rise through the ranks to become commissioner. He's a graduate of the Senior Executive Program at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. And we're just very honored to have you here tonight. I think you're the highest ranking dignitary we've had here um, in years, actually. Thank so you. Um, we're you really pleased you were ever, ever, OK. <laughs> we're very pleased you were able to make time for us um, during this busy time. Um, Robin Nagel is Clinical Associate Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Draper Program for the Humanities and, the social, and social Thought here at NYU. She has served as the anthropologist in residence in the Department of Sanitation since 2006, and she will be collaborating with the department on building an archive and a museum, and we hope to talk more about that uh, this evening with Robin. So I'm just going to tell you a little story about picking up. Um, when I heard Picking Up was coming out, I put a hold, as many of you do, I'm sure many of you students and staff, faculty, are well versed in putting holds on things at Bope's Library, which is kind of mean because it actually takes it away from somebody else. But I had to get this book, so I put a hold on the book, um, and the very next day I was able to pick up the book, but it was a Thursday. The following day it got recalled <laughs> by another patron who was doing what I was doing, but now it's being done to me. Um, and so I realized I, I better get going with this book, and I started to read it right away. Um, I actually told Samara Quandrell, who's here, she's the archivist of the Department of Environmental Protection, that I had a hard time getting the book. And she said, I'm 40th in line at the Brooklyn Public Library. You have a copy. <laughs> so I felt very fortunate to have my borrowed copy. And as it turned out, it's such a page turner, this book, that I read the entire thing in one weekend. I could not put it down and I was able to return it to the next anxious patron uh, the following Monday. Um, really, it is a book that, it, not only is it a page turner, it really takes you in, and it's something that is very compelling. It's a cogent analysis of the general public's consistent undervaluing of sanitation workers, and that really comes through when you read this book. Um, you will no longer walk past a sanitation worker without saying good morning, or thank you, or hello, after you've read this book. Um, in a city that generates 11,000 tons of trash a day, we New Yorkers, we're 8.2 million of us, okay, and 11,000 tons of trash, not, let me just repeat, a day, not a week, but each day. Um, we pay no attention to those who remove it for us. And, and Robin argues that the men and women of the Department of Sanitation comprise the most important uniformed workforce on the streets. And as I said, when you read this book, you will find that a very convincing argument. So here's just a quick quote from Robin. She says, no city can thrive without a work workable solid waste management plan. If sanitation workers are not out there every day, the city becomes unlivable fast. And I, I really feel like her book serves as kind of a corrective to the invisibility and the disrespect that sanitation workers experience daily. And she really repositions uh, work, these sanitation workers as the noble public servants that they are. And that comes across very clearly when you read the book. Now, in the second half of the book, as if that's not enough, there's a second half of the book where Robin actually um, goes through the process of becoming a sanitation um, worker and learns how to drive uh, what we think of as street sweepers. But they actually, when you read the glossary, there's an entire glossary that tells you how to speak sanitation speak. Uh, they're called bumper cars. So uh, she learns how to actually go and drive one of the sweepers and serve with the men and women of the force. Um, and that, as a good cultural anthropologist, is her fieldwork um, of this experience. And it really comes across as something very meaningful when you read the book. So before we turn to our panelists, I just want to recount a quick anecdote uh, related to tonight. I recently, um, as Jane said, um, took this job. And I was 
sharing some information with my family. I was written to my aunt and uncle who live in Westchester, and they're not academics, they're regular civilians. And I let them know what I was up to and where I was working. And I was very surprised when my uncle Ira replied to the email, but even more so by what he said. He wrote, very interesting. What are the humanities disciplines? What is the connection to an anthropologist studying New York City sanitation workers? And I just thought, oh, God, even he's asking these questions. And I just thought that was a really, I was actually quite grateful. Um, because we do think of anthropology and cultural anthropology in particular as being within the humanities here at the Humanities Initiative. But at other schools, it's thought of as a social science. It's seen as more quantitative. Um, so I thought that's one thing we could think about tonight is how this fits in in some ways. And, and for me, with the experience of reading this book, I would say it really documents a very human experience and in that way is part of the humanities. So we were able to make it great new books in the humanities, um, despite what Uncle Ira says. Um, <laughs> So as I said, there won't be any formal presentations tonight. Uh, the format will basically be, um, I have a few questions that I'd like to ask, and hopefully we'll just have a conversation with both Professor Nagel and uh, Commissioner Doherty. And then, of course, we will open it up to, to questions from all of you in the audience. And then we get to go have a nice reception, and you'll be able to purchase Robin's book and have her sign it for you. Or we will have slides. Can you just explain what it is? Then? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I have a, there's a slideshow that's going to run concurrently. This is not. I don't narrate this. It's uh, ideally I would give you all 9,000 sanitation personnel and the facilities and the equipment and where they work and the streets they clean and the kinds of humor they share and the difficulties they face. But that's a little tough given the constraints of time and reality. So these pictures are just going to roll and um, th yeah, and it's a it's a loop. So they'll they'll roll just behind us, um, and you'll learn even more about the job by he listening and, and watching. That's all. Great. <laughs> so Robin's going to start the slideshow. And um, I thought I would just start out with a question for the commissioner. Um, just kind of an open question. And I think it's something we're probably all thinking about. Um, you've served for so long. I think you're the longest serving uh, commissioner. What, what brought you to this job? How did you make this decision to join this profession? It's not the job I wanted. <laughs> okay. When I was young, my father told me and my brothers, I had two brothers and a sister, that uh, he thought we should go to college and if uh, he would always try and help us out. But if we didn't go to college to take the civil service test, well, the three boys decided they wanted to be firemen and uh, not go to college. And two of them did. And uh, this young fella with a red hair, uh, decided that uh, he better go back to school. I was working in the bank at the time, and I got called for sanitation. And I remember sitting there, almost tears coming down my eyes, and, uh, down my face. I said, I don't want this job. And my mother reminded me that I was getting very close to getting married, and I better start thinking about how to raise a family and be able to uh, afford children and, and bring them up in the world. So I took the job. Uh, and over the years, it turned out to be uh, the best move I ever made, at least uh, for me. Uh, I had the opportunity to take, in, in my time, four different promotional exams and then get appointments. So it was not the job I wanted, but I ended up in a place that I was very, very happy uh, to be. Did you think of yourself as a le like? When did you start to think of yourself as someone who would be a leader in the department? Or did that just kind of evolve? It, it evolved. I mean, I took the, my first promotional exam six months on a job because I figured, if, well, if I'm on this job, I would like to get promoted and, and move on and uh, have a better career. Uh, and I, as I took each exam, I would look like a, maybe a level above that, or maybe I can take that, that, get that, pass that test and get that position. And then after a while, I started looking up, and when uh, Mayor Giuliani was considering me for uh, for commissioner, I really was skeptical about taking the job because I was an operations guy, not so much a politician. And I said to the, uh, when I got the offer, I said to the then uh, first deputy mayor, Peter Powers, for, for Mayor Giuliani, I says, you know, I don't like the politics. I said, you handle the politics, and uh, I says, I'll handle the operation. He says, fine, and then he left. <laughs> so I survived after that somehow. <laughs> You know, actually, that's a really interesting point. Um, one of the things I've been wondering about is, do you have advice? Actually, this is a question for either one of you. Um, if you had a private meeting with de Blasio, what would your advice be for the incoming mayor? 
I think from my point of view, um, the thing that most people in New York are looking for all year round is clean streets. And I think we've come a long way in this city with improving the quality of life uh, in the street and the cleanliness of them. Uh, is it 100% all the time? No. Um, there are certain difficulties in this city uh, trying to maintain clean streets 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, but I think that's the most important thing. I think garbage gets picked up on a pretty regular basis. It's very, very rarely an interruption in it other than maybe snow or a holiday. And people kind of accept that. Oh, yeah, the can was out and it disappeared. Uh, in Manhattan, we all don't like seeing cans and bags out in the street or in the evening when we're going home. Uh, but that's one of the difficulties we have in a city. But gar the garbage getting picked up goes pretty quick, and we manage to get rid of it every day, and that's a whole – whole operation, a very intricate operation in itself. But cleaning streets, I think, is very important. I would, I would say that that has to be continue to be funded. And snow, of course, is the second thing, and that's kind of seasonal. And snow is always the, uh, the third rail uh, to mayors if uh, the Sanitation Commission doesn't get its job done in a timely manner. Uh, but basically, I think it's street cleaning is the most important thing that, uh, from, a, from the citizen's point of view that people like to see. I have a slightly different answer. Okay. I would like Mayor-elect de Blasio to read my book <laughs> because I've noticed in the media about his appointments, the very high-profile appointments, of course, are the ones that are, are named first, although there was a brief mention in the Times this morning that a sensitive appointment will be the sanitation commissioner. It has to be decided before snow falls. Um, I, frankly, hope that the current commissioner remains. Um, but that decision is not in my hands. <laughs> the, but what I would tell Mayor-elect de Blasio is, even though it's not as high visibility in the media, the department has, over decades, honed its job so well that if he wants to step in and improve it, I strongly urge him to learn it first. That's, that goes for any of the city agencies um, that, that function smoothly. There's always room for improvement, of course, but especially with sanitation, it's so easy to look in from the outside and say, oh, I can make this run better. But it's not so easy to actually start to tinker with it without messing it up. So I would ask him, if he were requesting advice, to um, spend a little time learning what it takes to keep the city al alive. A and if I may introduce one guest who's here. Uh, among us, uh, who is an inspiration for my work from before I ever was connected to sanitation. Meryl latterman Eucles is the artist-in-residence for sanitation and is here tonight. Um, and uh, I mention her in the book. At the She frames the book, actually, because it was Meryl who, who first taught me that it's possible to really dig deeply into questions about garbage and labor and how we keep a city humming and not not consider that weird, not take that as like something you could only do on the side and you couldn't do seriously. Merrill was my um, inspiration from dec 87 was the first time I encountered her work. And uh, I'm deeply grateful to have to now be able to call her a friend. So um, and she's here tonight. So thank you for being here. She would have all kinds of things to tell the mayor, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um. I guess one thing that I was really struck by in the book is just, actually it's one of the ending quotes, it's one of the sanitation workers says, if you're lucky, you can go your whole life without ever having to call a cop, and you can go your whole life without ever having to call a fireman, but you need a sanitation worker every single day. And I just felt that's such a poignant sort of summation of a lot of what the book is about. And I guess my question for really for both of you, um, and maybe to start with the commissioner, is besides saying thank you, which we don't do enough of, and besides putting our trash out in a way that's respectful and neat, what can we do to sort of raise the social standing of sanitation workers in the city so there's more awareness for the important work that they do? The sanitation workers today, I think they perceive their, uh, I'm sure they perceive their job a lot different than I did in 1960. I was not proud of the work I did. And I never forget working um, in Lower Broadway, sweeping the streets. In front of the bank, I worked in, and I pulled a hat down over my head. I was very embarrassed about being a sanitation worker. 
uh, and years later, I would be down in the Canyon of Heroes uh, managing a cleanup after a major parade, and I had four stars on my collar and uniform, and I was very proud of it. And I think that has carried over not only for me as I moved up in the organization, but for the men and women that have come on to the job. It's, it, you get at least 40,000 people, sometimes more, filing for this job. And they don't look at it, oh, that's the worst thing I want to do, like I did when I was a young man. Uh, they want to make a living at it. They're proud of what they do. And they wear their uniform back and forth to work, which we never did. We put it in a shopping bag and brought it home to be cleaned on a regular basis. We never wore our uniforms off to work. Hmm. They do today. So I think their, their perception of how they're perceived by the public has greatly improved. There are times when, you know, people don't notice them. They may get upset. But they move through the, work, the job pretty quickly out on a collection truck. And I don't always have, you know, much time to talk to people. Like, go out and do their job. And when they get a pat on the back once in a while, uh, they're pretty happy about it. But I don't think they, they get too concerned about what the public thinks about them. They like their job. They do their job. And they're very happy doing that. One of my early mistakes when I first started to work with sanitation was I assumed that the job carries a stigma and that the workers wear the stigma with the uniform and that this is a very heavy burden. And in fact, that was an assumption that I had to let go of because the measure of worth of a sanitation worker is not what the public thinks of him, but what his fellow workers think of him. Mm -hmm. And that's an entirely different metric. And it, it, it's, it was almost arrogant of me to assume that, well, if the public thinks poorly of them, they're unhappy about that. Um, not so much. There are some I know who've been on the job for, in one case, 28, 29 years now, who uh, is a what's called a white shirt. He's a sanitation superintendent. He commands a garage and is probably one of the savviest street guys I ever encountered. His sense of the operational challenges and how to meet them in any situation always really impressed me. He lives in a kind of a uh, Tony part of the region and his neighbors still don't know what he does for a living and he will only ever tell them that he works for the city of New York. He will not tell them he works for sanitation. And I pressed him on that uh, and he said it's not shame, it's that he completely understands that his neighbors do not understand what the job entails and he doesn't want to deal with their misapprehensions about his work. He also happens to be uh, have a second job as a contractor, and so he's in people's houses all the time fixing their, you know, fixing them, and he thinks he would not get as much work if people knew he had a career with sanitation. But the idea that public value is is the bread and butter of the, of a worker's relationship to the job, not, no, it's not, it's, it's not that, and that was, that was where my anthropological uh, it, was a, it was a nice comeuppance for me as an anthropologist. To, like, put that whole thing, that set of assumptions, I had to just put them down. But what's interesting in what you're saying is also about um, the use of uniforms. I mean, you refer to them as a uniformed force, and what you said about uniforms and how there's more pride in uniforms now. Um, I didn't realize there was a white shirt, but it makes me think of George Waring in the 1890s and the white wings. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of uniforms and sanitation? The... The department was chartered in 1881 as the Department of Street Cleaning, it, as an independent government entity. There was a rule in place then that workers had to wear uniforms. It wasn't really followed. When George Waring was named Commissioner of Street Cleaning in 1895, he put a lot of innovations in place, including making the uniforms real, and he dressed the workers in white, specifically the sweepers. The carters were in brown, but the sweepers were in these bright white, some of these pictures show it, these bright white uniforms uh, of a heavy cotton sort of canvas cloth. I can only imagine how hot that must have been. And, and their helmets were the same as the police of the era to indicate two things. The white uniform was about medical, uh, to associate their work with medical, the medical profession because of the role that street cleaning has in safeguarding public health. He wanted that to be very bluntly explicit to anyone looking at the workers. And the helmet, because it imitated the police helmet, was to indicate authority. There was a third, there was a third element here. Um, 
it's a, it's really hard to sneak off to the pub when you're wearing a brilliant white uniform. <laughs> so there was a surveillance uh, element to it. Um, the uniform, it's been a uniformed force. That part of the job has been enforced, the uniform itself, since then. It, it hasn't been white in a very long time. And and there's a research project underneath that, by the way, that I've, I, I mentioned this uh, pretty often. No one's taken me up on it yet. But who washed those uniforms? Who were probably the women behind those exclusively male workers back then who who laundered them? Um, I, that's... I. I really want to see that research. But so the uniform now, it's uh, the official color is spruce. It's sort of janitor green. But the name is emblazoned on it in bright white. And um, there are, th there's a personal appearance code. Actually, Commissioner Darty instituted this in 2002 to help the some workers get a little sloppy maybe with how they're dressed sometimes, which is understandable when it's a messy day. But um, the uniform does, but yeah, the uniform does instill a different s relationship to the job a little bit, in I think an important way. Um, just to turn to another topic, um, something Robin and I have spoken about in the past. You know, at NYU we have this this motto about being the pr a private university in the public service, and um, I don't know, we're not sure we see so much of that. And so one of the things we've been talking about is just how can scholars engage um, more publicly um, and work in a way that connects more to the city? Um, and scholars also need to give back, and, and especially in areas where uh, work is taken for granted or invisible. So I guess I would just ask Robin, you know, given your experience with this book, um, can you kind of take us through a little bit how you think scholars and the city can work together? And, and maybe is there some way through either the archive or the museum that this can reach a broader audience from your own, your own work? Scholars, we as a community have gotten really good at talking to each other. And th that's okay, but I feel strongly we have a much bigger obligation, which is to make sure our work also reaches audiences for whom it is intended. As we serve causes that are bigger than ourselves, ideally, and I think that in fact that should always be we should always be asking, okay, how can I make sure that my work has a place in a larger world outside of an ivory tower, outside of an academic context? The measures of our success inside the academy don't always take that into account. You can get tenure and live a, a happily ever after academic life without ever writing a, a paragraph that is comprehensible to an intelligent lay reader. Um, I feel that um, that's a little bit of an abdication of a basic responsibility, um, particularly given the privilege that academics have in today's world. We are truly some of the most privileged human beings in the history of the species, okay? So uh, with my own work with sanitation, the book is one effort, the archive is an effort. When I was doing my own research, I was impressed at how difficult it was to find basic information about the infrastructure and the organization and the daily work of sanitation back through the ages. And I would like it to be easier for those who come after me. We're doing an oral history project. We'll have eight new voices up uh, in about six weeks. And that's actually begun to pick up some speed. And I'm, um, I'm delighted with the kinds of stories and reflections that my students are getting from people in all different walks of the job. There will be a museum. From my mouth to God's ears, there will be a museum. Uh, that's been on the back burner for a little while, but uh, after the turn of the year, it's going to become, uh, I'm going to be on fire for that. So those are some ways. But, but it's also, it, it's bigger in a sense than sanitation in New York. Our relationship to the world around us that is so comfortable with such temporary objects that are then gone and that we, I, I'm, I'm still deeply puzzled as to how we got to this kind of moment and how we might turn it around. Um, and, and scholars have the responsibility to look at questions like that, but that's where as a community it's much broader than any individual and it's much broader than any uh, sort of the enclave of a scholarly conversation. Yeah, that's too small for that set of questions. Mm -hmm. It has to be uh, a much bigger arena, and, it, and in fact it is. There are many of us working on these kinds of things. Um, 
I, I could go on for a while, but I'm going to stop oh, there. I happen to know, and I'll share this with all of you, that one of the things Robin asks her students to do is to hang on to the garbage that they generate for 48 hours. That's a pretty sobering. I haven't had the nerve to do it yet, um, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about how that, what kind of an impact that makes. It, it usually does, uh, the, it does a few things pretty successfully. It helps my students understand, it, it breaks their mental patterns, because if you have a piece of, an object that in, in a normal rhythm you would just let go of. For those 48 hours, you can't. And it, it's, it's like a stutter in a thought pattern that is usually very thoughtless. And I don't mean that in a negative way, just sort of, that's just, we just let go. So when you can't let go, even for a short time, it, there's, a, there's a kind of a startle mechanism, especially when you realize across 48 hours how many times with how many things we do just let go. Um, I will tell you that students edit their behavior a little bit so that they generate less kinds of trash or <laughs> that they they decide not to go to the restaurant where it's all paper and plastic <laughs> utensils until after the 48 hours are over. But um, they also I also ask them to save one object that they would discard and use it until it, it actually breaks or is no longer usable. And I ask them to take one disposable, commonly used object and replace it with a durable object. That also teaches lessons about thought patterns because if you're going to use a, uh, a, a coffee mug, a travel mug, but you forgot it that day, does that mean you can't have coffee? Oh, that's a, that's a challenge. <laughs> but the idea that you have to remember it and then when you take it home you have to remember to wash it because if you didn't remember to wash it and you take it the next day, oh, you don't want to take it the next day. So it's a whole, it, it, those three exercises together help my students begin to recognize the deep cultural embeddedness of the practice of discarding that is so inherent to contemporary life. And, and picking up on that, Commissioner, maybe you could help us um, just understand some of the things that have happened during your long term of service in terms of composting and um, recycling. I mean, recycling is fairly new, especially with hard plastics um, in New York. And maybe something about waste to energy and, and what's being discussed w with all of that. Well, re recycling, I mean, when you look at it, and if you try to do something in your own home, your own apartment, you'd be surprised. As Robin pointed out, Dr. Nagel, if you start to accumulate it and then you start to sort it out and say, well, this I can do recycle and this I can recycle, that pile of garbage gets smaller and smaller. I was having um, kind of a back and forth with a councilman at one point that was the chair of the Sanitation and Solid Waste Committee uh, of Staten Island. And when I lived on Staten Island, I said to him, Mike, let's have a uh, competition as to see uh, who can recycle the most in their family, uh, in their house. And uh, he never got involved with me because I wanted to give him a scale and everything. But I took the scale home, <laughs> and I found out that we were able to recycle, and maybe it was the wine bottles, we were able to recycle, because <laughs> everything's weight, you know, you got to look at its weight. We were able to get to 60%, and, and it was only two of us, so, you know, they didn't have a house full of children either, so it's a different environment, but you can do reduce a lot. And recycling has really been something that was, there's a history of recycling in the, in the city, and then it died, and, you know, it's, it's back again. But it's really what has to be done to reduce waste. I've always said landfilling the waste, and most of the waste, probably better than 90% of the waste in the city, gets landfilled. A small portion of it out of Manhattan, basically, goes to a, um, a waste energy facility in New Jersey. But the rest of the waste right now is all being uh, buried. Landfills create gases, <coughs> methane gas carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. That hurts global warming. So it's the worst way. And it actually, when you look at the state's chain on hierarchy for how you should get rid of waste, at one point it was waste energy was on the top of it. Landfilling was at the bottom. Hmm. Uh, so recycling is something we have to do better with in New York City. Right now in the city, we only, uh, when you look at the paper, metal, glass, and plastic, we're only capturing about 45% of what's in a waste stream. And we know that because we did a waste sort, a very detailed waste sort a number of years ago. Now, we know the paper has changed a lot because of computers, so I understand why the paper recycling is down a little bit. But still, you have to, we have to do more. Whether composting, 
on the residential level is going to work that well. I'm somewhat skeptical about that, uh, but I think it will work well, and legislation is going to be up for a vote, I think, next week uh, at the city council on restaurants and uh, shopping s uh, stores that generate uh, compostable waste. I think that's going to work well there, and it works well in schools or where you have large cafeterias, so that can work there. I think on, and we're going to, you know, still work on the residential sector of uh, compost material for the next two years. But I'm somewhat skeptical from what I've seen so far. Maybe we will. I'd rather concentrate on getting the people to do all the paper, do all the metal, glass, and plastic, and, and get that done. And we can reduce, uh, and the glass, of course, that's in there, we can reduce the waste by quite a bit when we do that, and we can recycle it. So from the environment, that's the best way to go. Uh, and that was something new we had doing a job. We never we never did recycle. We picked it up, put it in one truck, and, and either years ago, a lot of it was burnt because there was a lot of old incinerators in New York City that started in the 40s during LaGuardia when we had to stop dumping at sea back in the 30s. Uh, but uh, we'll have to do that. We learned how to do it, uh, but so much is relying on the public doing it. We can't do it. We can provide pickup. We can try and educate people. Uh, but if the public doesn't do it, you know, it, it becomes very difficult to have a successful program. So we have to continue to work on that. Waste to energy, I, I am for it. And uh, mayors from, uh, from, from going back as far as COTS that I remember uh, wanted to do it. Uh, we almost had a, a facility built in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which would have worked out well. That didn't work out good. From a transportation point of view, it would have worked out well. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg asked about it when he came in. I says, go for it. And that quickly changed. He realized that New York is very difficult to get uh, waste energy uh, to be accepted. But when you look at waste your energy throughout the country and either in Europe today, it, there's not as much of a trend. In this country, there's been really not much of an expansion on waste energy facilities. There's been some plants that have opened up an extra boiler or something like that, but it really hasn't gone over that well for many years. And in Europe, even they're getting away from it. Uh, they push for more recycling, and they're looking to um, eliminate many of their waste energy facilities, particularly as they get older. You've you got to upgrade them anyway, so they're looking to do that. So there's a different, there's a trend on that to get away from it. But we have to recycle. If you, if you don't recycle it and you don't burn it, um, you're going you're gonna to end up with major problems. And here in the Northeast, getting rid of waste by landfilling, it is very expensive. You've got a transportation model that you have to get it from point A to point B, and point B is down south or out west, and Midwest in some cases. But uh, when you live in the Midwest or you live in the, in the south or, or the west coast, there's a lot of open land, so landfilling is cheap. So people say, the government says, well, bury it, bury it. We don't want to add more of a fee to people. And outside of New York City, most people pay to have their garbage picked up. I mean, you don't realize that, and you live outside the city. We provide the best service in this country, I bet it's in the world. You put it out, we pick it up just about. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no question about it. You live, I lived in California for three years. You put it in that can. If it didn't fit in that can, you had to pay somebody to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on how well you recycle, a big can cost more, a small can costs less. So you, everybody bought a small can because recycling is free, no charge. And uh, you recycle more, so you didn't have to pay for your garbage. So that's a trend we're going to have to work on. And um, I think over time, it's going to take time to grow on it. You know, you like to see the young people coming up, the children coming in school. Um, and I think over time, it's not something that's going to happen quickly, but I think it's something that has to happen if we want to address um, waste and how we handle waste in the future. Did you want to add anything to that? Um, just out of curiosity, where is residential composting happening? Is that happening? Is there a pilot program in Queens? We have, no, Queens will start in the spring. We'll have a district out in Queens. Right now we have one area in Brooklyn, we have an area in Staten Island, and we have one area in the Bronx, and in Manhattan and Brooklyn we're doing about 200 schools, public schools right now. We're going to expand that to 400 schools. Uh, we'll start the school expansion in, next expansion will be in January, I think, okay. and we'll have that by the spring, yeah. And the Chinese have gardens, right? Are we we have, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one, thank you. Uh, when you think about residential buildings, you don't think recycling is going to work that well. But when you look at the tonnage coming out of these facilities, I always found that, particularly the Upper East Side of Manhattan, we used to get, we get buildings, and even on uh, the Greenwich Village area, and, and we have, well, they have some low-rise over there, but a high-rise building. 
we can get 25, 27% diversion rate uh, over there. And that, that's pretty good considering that we're not, we're only doing about 15% in the city. So that's pretty good diversion rate. Is it where you want to be? No. But the Morningside Gardens, as Dr. Negum pointed out, uh, we went up there and I had them with tonnage, run the, the truck separately to get their tonnage. I want to know exactly how much garbage was coming out for a week and how much was coming out on recycling and how much was coming out on food waste. So I ran separate trucks to find that and have a baseline to work off from that point. We were getting 35% diversion rate. That is terrific. I've never seen a high-rise building do that well. And that's because the people wanted to do it. It's another case of people wanting to do it. You provide the card for them. You provide the service. You tell them what to do, and they do it. And that's a difficult part uh, about getting it done. And, and in fairness to people who live in high-rise buildings, I happen to live in a building now where we have a, a, a garbage room, a, a refuge room, and they have recycling in there and they have cans for it. A lot of people live in buildings where you don't have that convenient, and that makes it very difficult for them. They don't want to bring it down, says public housing is always an issue. People say, well, we got to do more in public housing. True. I lived in public housing when I was young. You don't have the capability to do it. These are old buildings that were built for incinerators. They just have a chute down there. It goes to a compactor. You want to recycle something there, you got to carry it down to the street, you know. With, when it's near your apartment, you got a private house, you reach out the back door, you put it out there. You, reach, you go to the garbage room in a building, you put it there. You know, you don't have to store it in your own apartment. That's the difficult thing that the people have in fairness to people that live in, in many of the high-rise buildings. But there's still more they can do. Even saying that, there's more they can do. Let me just explain briefly about Morningside Gardens. It's six buildings on the Upper West Side, north of Columbia, south of Harlem. Uh, it's They're cooperative apartments. These are not rental units or public housing. The, they're... Uh, um, owner, uh, resident owned, and there's a, they are very eager for this to work. The whole staff is on board. Um, a colleague of mine is actually doing an ethnographic uh, accompaniment of this project as it rolls out in Morningside Gardens, and uh, there are some really key elements to its success. The staff buy-in is big. If the staff isn't going to uh, have their boots on the ground to make sure things are separated and put in the right places, it, it won't work, um, no matter how uh, meticulous the residents are. But as the commissioner says, the residents are also very eager that this works well. So um, it'll be interesting to watch it un unfold. Um, I just have a couple more questions, and then we'll open it up to, to the audience for questions. Um, so when you read this book, you realize that the sanitation worker's job is very dangerous and much more dangerous than people think. And actually, there's a story of Bloomberg mentioning this at a press conference and being chided for it later. Um, but he was actually accurate. Um, so I guess I just wondered about how risk can be managed and, and how we can work to make this a le less dangerous job for the people who choose to do it. What if there were legislation that said you can't go around a garbage truck just like you can't go around a stopped school bus? This was an effort uh, that was suggested by some folks on Facebook after a fatal accident in January of 2010 where a sanitation worker in Queens was killed. There was a, an illustration that just passed a photograph of two trucks. Those were trucks in two separate accidents. Both drivers were killed in those accidents. The sources of danger are from traffic. They're in and out of traffic all day. And from the trash itself catapulting back out uh, at them when it's pushed into the truck. The blade uh, exerts a pressure of approximately 2,200 pounds per square inch, and, and when a bag gets caught just the wrong way, it pops like a balloon, and what's inside is launched. And that, that's, in fact, how another worker was killed um, in 1996. The traffic issue, though, it's not just that they're getting in and out of the truck in traffic. It's that the traffic itself sees a big white truck in the street, and they just want to get by it. They just want to have the obstacle no longer in their way. And the idea that there are human beings actually working that truck kind of doesn't enter most motorists' consciousness. And I think that by itself is one of the reasons that the job is ranked by the Bureau of Labor Statistics as one of the 10 most dangerous jobs in the country. Not New York specifically, but refuse work generally across the United States it's always within the top 10. And by comparison, police and firework aren't even in the top 20. And I'm not saying anything disparaging about our cousins in police and fire. But if you're a sanitation worker, I, when I came on the job, there was a, a young man who said his mother was so relieved that he was a sanitation worker because he was going to be safer. 
and I did not correct the mis uh, uh, the misapprehension because I didn't want to. First of all, he probably wouldn't have believed me, but he is not safer. In fact, he's at far greater risk of injury and and death because he's a Sandman. I mean, I, Robin basically uh, said it all. I mean, a lot of it, the injuries are caused, you know, picking up the waste in some form. I mean, uh, one of the issues from in my time when uh, everything was in a can, uh, whatever was in there wouldn't protrude from it and, and injure the worker. Uh, when we went to the plastic bags to make it convenient, even from a productivity point, for, point of view from the department, uh, and more convenient, uh, and getting cans off the street and that, sitting out there all the time, you would pick boys would pick up and good ladies would pick up a bag and they would let it come too close to their body and anything that was sharp would protrude and a lot of guys used to get their thigh cut or you know depending on where the bag would sit. And there's a lot of injuries like that that happens. The the fatalities, uh, yeah, they're there unfortunately where people get get hit. Uh, when they're out in the street or caught behind a hopper at a truck. Uh, and um, it's just something that uh, is ingrained in the job. And I think we, we put in a lot of emphasis in the job on safety, you know, trying to get people to do things uh, more safely. Uh, and sometimes, uh, um, you, even with the best of safety uh, guidelines and regulations, you, you're still going to have accidents. That's the unfortunate part mm -hmm. about it. So my last question is really for both of you, just um, to help us think a little bit about what the future looks like and what are sort of the challenges of the next 50 years in terms of sanitation and keeping our streets clean. Well, uh, you know, I mean, s keeping our streets clean, as I said, was very important. I think that's going to be something that, uh, short of getting more personnel to be out there on a regular basis, we got to get the public more involved and businesses more involved. I think we've come a long, long way in this city on improving it. We have a system that started in 1975, set up by the Ford Foundation to rate the streets in New York City called Scorecard. It's not run by operation. We have to live by it. When that started off, the city's scorecard was at roughly 40 percent. Some streets in the city were like 10 percent acceptably clean. Today we had that score caught up in the low to mid uh, 90 percent acceptably clean. But it's, it's you know, it, you can look at fish in different times in the city, like maybe early in the morning before we get out there to clean. It's not may not be as neat uh, as one would like, but at least it gives us a way of looking at what we have to do. And the exercise is to clean as many streets as you can so that you can raise the level of cleanliness because they have a number of blocks throughout each district in the city uh, and each section in the city uh, that they rate on a regular basis going back to 1975-76. Uh, so the exercise for the managers out there is get those streets clean. So that has to be improved, but we can't do it all. The public has to do it. I think recycling has to grow a lot a lot faster and a lot better in, in the city. And, and one of the big things is it's very expensive to get rid of waste in a city. By the time you pick it up, deliver it to a transfer station, and have it then further delivered to a landfill, or maybe in a case of Manhattan, driving over to uh, Newark, New Jersey, and put it in a waste energy facility, it gets to be pretty expensive. And that ex expense is going to go up. Now, when you have a city that has to provide social services, has to buy police and fire and security for the people that live in that city, it gets to be a strain on a budget. So something has to be done to improve it. And one of the ways of doing it is reduce the amount that we have to transport long distances, and that's through recycling. Now, recycling is not cheap, don't get me, get me wrong, but over the long term, getting rid of garbage is going to get more and more expensive. And I've seen it go up right now. We're spending about $97 a ton to get rid of garbage. It's going to climb as we put in a these new transfer stations, have to go further distances to get rid of it. That number is going to climb up into the mid-150s. I can see that. If we can collect more recyclables and reduce the number of waste we can get rid of, the, the cost for recycling will become cheaper when we look at it per ton basis, and we can get rid of it or have it recycled for a lot cheaper than that. Right now, we're getting rid of metal, glass, and plastic by a, by a company uh, for, a, it costs us, I think we're up to about $72 a ton right now. Should look at 92 on garbage, we'll say, and uh, a 97, I think it is, and uh, 72 on, on recyclable material, metal, glass, and plastic. The problem is the collection cost. I can pick up 10 tons in a garbage truck. I only pick up maybe five tons in a recycling truck. So from a tonnage point of view, well, we have to change that. We have to change that. 
And if we can, we'll be able to run the economics of garbage uh, a, a lot more efficiently in the city. And that, that's something that really has to be done uh, because you just can't bear the burden of uh, paying um, the amount of money you have to pay to get rid of every ton of garbage in the city. And that's only going to grow if we don't recycle. I'm going to focus this answer uh, uh, slightly differently. Some people look at the history of curbside recycling in the U.S. and say we're at the 40th anniversary. They look at 1973. That was the year when curbside programs went from a few dozen. That That's when it crossed over the 100 mark. There were In 1973, there were more than 100 communities around the country. And now we have thousands and thousands of towns and cities where curbside recycling is a basic part of the infrastructure of waste management. Municipal solid waste in the United States accounts for 3% of the waste stream. With that statistic in mind, how do we begin to reconfigure the conversation, take the kind of initiative and energy and focus and drive that got curbside recycling off the ground, that got it successful, and, and broaden the conversation so that we go to the manufacturers and we say, do we really need these seven or eight different kinds of rosins that are the plastics that we use in all of our daily lives now? Do we really need to be that the burden of discarding and recycling falls to the individual and is not the responsibility of the producer? This is a controversial idea and it is one that is um, debated very hotly in some circles and uh, I won't go into all of that now but the, the way in which cities are responsible for waste management is partly a way in which the creators of the waste are kind of not held to the same standard that the municipalities are in dealing with those end products, dealing with the discards. So why do we not r require anyone making a thing to have built into the thing's lifespan an end plan? Why does it have to fall to the cities that the end plan is on us? Um, that's where I hope waste challenges, I hope we begin to address that challenge when we think about waste management at the municipal level um, because I think that's, we focus on, a, on the curb and that's really important. It's time to, to back up, to look upstream, as they say, to broaden our perspective so that it includes the curb. We don't have to abandon the curb, but I think we need to be asking those questions of a much broader scale. Just, just to add to that, recently uh, the city council passed legislation requiring that the manufacturers of uh, refrigeration units, whether it's a refrigerator or an air conditioner, that sort of thing where you have the gas in there that has to be removed, uh, that they have to fund it. And we're working with the uh, the oversight group that they have to um, to collect the fee because we go out, we remove the gas, and then we pick up that item and we recycle it. But it's going out with our work is removing the gas from uh, these uh, units. So it's the first step forward. It's been something that's been on the drawing boards for many, many years, uh, but it's now you got pushed far enough. And I think today with recycling and more concern about a green environment, uh, that the companies are feeling. I mean, you even see today in a paper, and at times they're talking about the big companies, particularly oil refineries, being responsible for the carbon emissions that they have, and they're going to have to pay for that. Well, one thing is pay for it. The other thing is really to reduce it. And hopefully by getting to, to pay for it, they'll find out, they'll find better ways of reducing the emissions from these, uh, from these places, just like we had to reduce the emissions on our vehicles. That's a whole other story, how we go through that. To have basically the cleanest diesel engine trucks in the city. Is the diesel engine the best engine? Probably not, but we're working with CNG and other things, hydraulic vehicles, hybrid vehicles. So there's that side of sanitation that people don't realize. You know, it's a very intricate job that nobody really thinks, oh, it's a garbage picked up, you sweep my streets, it's my street plowed. But behind the scenes, <laughs> there's an awful lot going on, and a lot of it is just to improve the environment. Okay, now I know you all must have some questions out there. So who would like to ask a question? I'm really struck by the images that were playing as you were speaking, um, in particular the ones with the snow and the water removal. And so my apologies if you addressed this before I came in, but I'm wondering if you could speak about that. And about snow and? And, and the water, I, it looked like there was like cleanup from flood. Like well, that was, a, water. that was with the mechanical brooms? 
Okay. That was from Hurricane Sandy. Sandy. Yeah. I just wonder if you can speak about that as part of the department's r role and, and how the people who are working for the department, how they think about that as part of their job, if it is in fact part of their job. Snow removal. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to do well, that? Well, the snow removal, it's at that point the sanitation workers are the hero to the city. You'd be surprised. Absenteeism goes down. Yes, they make a little overtime. Let's not kid ourselves. But they, they like to do that. It's something different. When you go out every day and pick up garbage all day long, you get it done fine. But when you go out there to address snow and clear the streets, the morale actually builds up, especially when they get credit in the newspaper for doing it. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes you get a storm in a city that you can't clean it as quick as, as, quick as you cleaned the last storm. And in New York City, New Yorkers, whatever you did last, you got to do better than that tomorrow. That's New York. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that attitude. I mean, you look at that at work, too. What you do today, let's see if we can do it better tomorrow. And if we bring the high-tech people in, what you made today, we want it smaller, better, and faster. <laughs> When you're in training in sanitation, the the supervisors and the teachers will tell you that when it snows, sanitation owns you. And you have absolutely no idea what that means until the snow arrives. And then suddenly, you're on a 12-hour shift for seven days, for weeks. When the December 2010 storm hit, I know workers who were on the job for seven days, for 12-hour days, for 38 days straight, for 41 days straight. After Hurricane Sandy, it was the same thing. This, the department has to step into the breach. The department is the one charged with snow removal for disaster response. It's less overt. The city doesn't assume sanitation is the one that steps forward first, but in fact, sanitation with Sandy, sanitation was the first agency on the ground and the last agency to leave. So. Um, you, when you first come on, you have absolutely no idea. You just, you have no idea. What does that, they own you, what does that mean? And then it's 12 hour days and seven day weeks and endless and uh, it, uh, they call it blood money. There is this sort of energy uh, when it first snows of like, oh, overtime. And after uh, a week or two, it's, it's you're, the energy Tiring. is definitely, it's, very, it's exhausting. Tiring. It's exhausting. Some people who live far away will actually just sleep in, the, in their cars um, until there's a little bit of a respite and they can make the commute home. Um, yeah. Just an interesting point on, on getting rid of snow. I can remember, I think it was a storm in 86, and we used to dump a lot of snow in the rivers out of here in Manhattan and different waterfronts, even in Staten Island, places in Brooklyn uh, and Queens, we would dump snow in the rivers and the waterways. And uh, I remember after that storm being out at a, uh, one of our um, disposal points where we were dumping in on the west side of Manhattan, and I seen the Coast Guard over there with video cameras. <laughs> I said to the guys, we're not going to be dumping it in the river much longer, I tell you, tell you that, <laughs> because I knew something. There was a fear that there was debris in it coming up when we you cleaned it all up was going into the water. There was also a concern by some people that there was salt in it because we salted the roadways. I used to say, well, the rivers around here have salt in them already, but they're fine. You. But, you know, the thing, we had to go out. What are we going to do? We bought melters. We big bought huge snow melters that we can position around the city so that we can get rid of it today. And we have to work with DEP over there to put it, make sure we got it right over the right sewer so that the water will t be able to flow or else it'll be backing up in somebody's basement if we pick the wrong one. So we work with them and I think they're going to start painting the, uh, the, uh, the sewer caps, so we know in certain areas which is a safe sewer for us to use when we set one of our melters up. So you can see how things have to evolve in the department. That's the behind the scenes people don't know, oh, you know, what? how do you get rid of it? That's one of the, in my day, we used to open up a sewer and shovel it in, and then we closed the sewer. <laughs> one of the other things people don't know about snow, among the many things they don't know about the job, no storm is like any other storm. You think, oh, there's snow. They've dealt with it before, they'll deal with it today, it's the same. Nuh uh. Every storm has its own personality, its own unique configuration. It's heavier in the Bronx and it's not so heavy in Staten Island. And then the next time it buries Staten Island, bar barely touches the Bronx. It comes in wet, then it gets dry. It comes in dry and solid and freezing, then it turns to rain. It was cold ahead of time, so it stays on the ground forever. It was 30 degrees ahead of time and it melts the next day and it's a mess. Every storm is its own adventure. And to say, well, they've always done it and so they always can do it, that's true but they always must figure out with each storm what's necessary. 
because it you it is never a cookie cutter response from one to the next. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about where our garbage is going and our relationship with the places where it goes. The our relationship with the landfills. Yeah, well, like I said, in Manhattan, the west side of Manhattan, some of the east side of Manhattan. Manhattan has 12 districts. Uh, eight of them are going to go to the uh, waste energy facility in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and that's the cheapest way of getting rid of it. I think we're paying about $63 now, and that's going to go into the 70s. So if we look at economic point of view, it works out well. But uh, it's not something that's that acceptable. I mean, we get a waste that will go down into the Georgia, down into the Carolinas. It goes by train today. Just about everything goes by train. The short haul, some of the, some of the private companies are bringing it to uh, Jersey. There's still some <laughs> landfill capacity in Jersey, but that's running out. And Pennsylvania, they still have some landfill capacity in Pennsylvania. So from an economic point of view, with a private car is in some of the transfer station we deal with, they'll truck it to a landfill close in where they can make a round trip and it's worth it. But a lot of the stuff goes out by rail. Staten Island goes out by rail now. All the waste out of the Bronx goes out by rail. Uh, in Manhattan, if you live on the east side, you know where 91st Street is, and they don't want us there, but we're going to build a, uh, a new marine transfer station there. It's in the works right now, and that'll be loaded into containers. It'll be dumped on the floor, packed down into containers. It'll be sealed. The containers will be sealed, go onto a barge, and it will go to an unloading point, um, which is, hasn't been set up yet, but to an unloading point where it'll be picked up and put on a railroad car and taken to distant landfills. When it gets to those landfills, they're run by major companies. Waste management is one of the, uh, the largest. Um, when they get there, the communities that have accepted them, they have a lot of land around them. So they find a spot where they will prov allow the company, in case waste management, <laughs> to build a landfill. And today the landfills are... are uh, really engineered well, you know, so you don't have leachate problems, they capture the gas too, but there still is a problem with it. And they, then that waste management is case, they pay a host community agreement uh, to the community. And many communities are very happy to get that, some of these counties, because it pays for their police service, maybe their fire service, and some of the social uh, services that they want to provide to the public. So they're very happy to get it. There was one place, I always remember it, um, in uh, Pennsylvania that waste management had. They were painting, this was such a big landfill, they wanted to keep it. They were painting the homes in that, in that, in that town every couple of years as a benefit to the public. And in some cases, the public got money from them. Somehow they had a deal going where you, if you were in that community, you would get some money. So from that point of view, people like it, but it's still not the best way to go. And after a while, those, those fills are going to be filled up, and then you have to go further, and your transportation model and the cost for that starts to become very difficult, so you don't want to do that. But it's the new system with rail is part of the city's solid waste management plan that we've been working on for, for a long time. It's not cheap, but it's, it's, some, it's a way of, of containing your waste and getting it out of the city in an environmentally safe manner. One of the issues with sending our garbage so far away, um, there are host communities all over the country now, accepting New York City garbage, uh, and issues of environmental justice come up. Um, some of the counties are very rural and very poor, and the idea of hosting a landfill, um, why are we putting it in a poor rural community? Um, is that unfair? And there are strong arguments that uh, say, yes, that's quite unfair. The flip side of that is, as the commissioner pointed out, it can be very lucrative for the community. So it's a little bit of a devil's bargain. The other thing to keep in mind is that, as he mentioned, landfills today are highly engineered and extremely regulated. I'm not saying that everyone wants to live downwind of one, no matter where they are, but a landfill today is not like an open dump. It's not the horror of the stereotype of decades gone by. They have to be lined. They have to have leachate retrieval and methane retrieval. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not as awful as it used to be. Um, but, the, but the issues of justice and of equity and of um, compensation, those are still thick questions, and they are resolved differently in different parts of the country. I actually have two questions. <laughs> Could you uh, both talk a bit about the school's um, programs to have more environmental? I just read an article in the Times this week about um, not using styrofoam um, plates in the schools and, and 
something about that program? That's number one. And two, could you talk a bit about the Sanitation Museum? Because you know I think is. that it's an outrage that the police have a museum, the fire department has a museum, and this great, great city service needs a museum. So could you talk about where you'd like it to be and what kind of museum? Maybe that should be first. I, I'll take the uh, styrofoam question. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, we have a bill before the city council. I expect that it'll come out of uh, out soon for the, uh, I think it was put on a desk of the councilman last night, and it should come up for a vote next week. By the, it came out of committee uh, to ban styrofoam in New York City. Uh, there's a, a lot of opposition to it by a company that manufactures it, uh, but it's a product you can't get rid of it and you can't recycle it. Um, and the Department of Education, of course, has, like many people, use styrofoam trays. Uh, they have agreed to, I think, very expensive, too, to get rid of the uh, styrofoam trays, but they have agreed to uh, purchase uh, biodegradable trays. There was a group of mothers on the west side of Manhattan who found some funding themselves, the PTA, and they went out and they had purchased uh, compostable trays. And that's kind of where we started the school compost program uh, based on what those mothers were doing and the people in the school themselves, the staff working with them. Uh, so I think that legislation is going to go through. I think where it'll end up is that uh, the Commissioner of Sanitation, uh, within some time period, will have to show that uh, the, the styrofoam uh, is not recyclable, and that'll be something we'll do. But I think in the long run, a lot of cities around the country has banned it already, and I think uh, New York City will, will eventually ban it too. And we just have to learn to uh, get our cup of coffee in a paper cup. And, uh, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. You get that paper cup and you can recycle a paper cup. I mean, people, you know, one of the things people think about recycling, they don't think about it. I get a cup, paper cup of coffee in the morning. I rinse it out a little bit because I happen to have a sink. But if I don't rinse it out, if I go to City Hall, I get a cup. I just fold it up and it goes to the paper bin. People don't think about it. If you want to make recycling work, you got to look at... Can I recycle a piece of paper? Where do I put it? How do I get rid of it? That's what you have to think. When you start thinking about little pieces of paper or little items, then you know you're going to recycle, and that's when it's going to make it work. But if you think of the newspaper and the soda can and the plastic bottle, we're not going to get to where we want. You've got to think about everything. Because when you look and you figure it out, if you sort everything out, try it out yourself, even if you have to throw it in the garbage, is this recycle, is this recycle? And think about it. You'll find out how much you can recycle. And think about the small things. <laughs> The museum. <laughs> this is an image of a facility that was built in 1950 by Robert Moses on the west side of the village, Community Board 2. Uh, this is at, on the Gansevoort Peninsula, the only piece of land on the Hudson north of Chambers Street and south of, I want to say the GWB, but I think you have to go even farther up than that. Now, I have to, before I continue, I have to put in a very important caveat here. The, what I'm going to describe is not endorsed by NYU. We have, as you know, perhaps, sometimes tense relationships with CB2. So I'm not speaking for the university. It is also not endorsed by the Department of Sanitation or Commissioner Doherty, who has basically <laughs> told me it's a hopeless pipe dream, and I'm a fool <laughs> to try to make this happen. However, he didn't tell me that I couldn't do it. So with his indulgence, <laughs> the smokestacks are gone, OK? The community, when, the, when this was built, the, the facility here, this part is the marine transfer station. The trucks came up on either side. They dumped. Uh, this is where it was dumped and burned. Um, this is still here. This is the Manhattan 4 garage now. The smokestacks are gone, but this building is still here. That's the Manhattan 2 garage. And it's right across the street from, this is, this is that marine transfer station, what it looks like now. I'll tell you, it's colder than a, in the winter. Uh, as a garage. They put trailers in there, but it's still pretty pretty uh, frosty. Um, but beautiful, right? This is almost like stained glass, this strange uh, cladding. Um, that's the salt shed near the front of it. Th this is from a different talk that I give. That's the Whitney Museum that's being built immediately across the street, okay? So, and this is, uh, it's also right across from the High Line. The Gansevoort Peninsula, as you may know, is a hotly uh, 
a lot of people want that particular piece of real estate because the Hudson River Park, which has now become one of the most fantastic green spaces in this part of the city, that particular piece of land, many different groups have many different ambitions for how it should be used. It's eight acres. I don't want much. I just want that one building that was built as an incinerator that was then turned into a garage to become the museum for the Department of Sanitation, right across the street from the brand new Whitney, a couple of blocks away from the south entrance to the High Line, big enough to stage old equipment, modern equipment. One of the slides you saw that went through earlier was one of Merrill's sculptures, the social mirror, where she clad a truck with a mirror. And when people see it, the idea is in part that they might kind of remember that they are reflected on the sides because they put what's in it inside of it, right? Um, and, and in fact, other works of hers that I would love to have a place for, but also a place for the community to come. Um, the sanitation has a pipe and drum band, and why can't they rehearse there? On, they rehearse on Monday nights. Come on down to the museum, right? The, there are so many ways in which a sanitation museum can be like, say, the transit museum. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's a fantastic, vibrant, a very creative, thoughtful um, set of exhibitions, some permanent, some rotating. And I have been there and watched three-year-olds, 30-year-olds, and 90-year-olds caught by what they're seeing and learning and how they're able to, the kids especially, you know, sitting in a bus, sitting inside of a, an old train car um, with docents talking about the job transit with passion and knowledge. We can have that for sanitation. The, the pie in the sky part is this particular location. Because it's slated for demolition starting next year, and because Hudson River Park does not want anything on the Gansevoort Peninsula that is there right now, um, it could be doomed. But the wrecking ball didn't swing yet. And I've started some conversations with some folks who know far more than I do about the politics of arts advocacy and organization in the city and also particularly in Community Board 2. So I'm not even close to ready to give up on that location, it might not work. But what? If, how perfect would it be if it did work, right? W part of my inspiration for this is your show at the 59th Street transfer station before that was um, modified, Touch Sanitation in 1984, and the pictures that I've seen of that, Meryl, of this throng of the public coming to see the, w the ways in which you did the backup lights in this kind of staccato um, array, it was like, Morse city. code, and and you're right. Flow city, the walking through to see the the actual how garbage is how it traverses all of its different paths, and the gloves. M Meryl took. Uh, she asked every worker in the city to give her a pair of their gloves, used, done, uh, kaput, and she put them in. Oh, I've seen a couple of different variations on this, so correct me if I get the details wrong. But there was a trough of them. Like this, this beautiful, it was a net full of all of these gloves that had been used by workers on the job. And th there was another one where the gloves were sort of arrayed in a sculptural kind of um, creation that I happen to know is in the Betts Avenue incinerator, locked up. They've now sealed that exit, so I'm not sure how we'll get it out of there. But I had a tour of that years ago, and the, the uh, boss, the chief who was giving me the tour, had gone there the day before. And he knew exactly what was going to happen. So he staged himself so he could watch this. I round the corner, and there are all these hands, <laughs> like this. All of uh, it, the gloves. I jumped. I think I even yelled, because they were, they, it was quite surprising. Anyway, those are the kinds of things that should be in the museum. Educational, but not just educational. The best way a museum educational project works is that the public coming there doesn't know they're being educated. Right? It's not like, you now will learn all these important things. You, you are caught up in the story that the museum is telling. And that's what our museum is going to do, among many other things. The, one of the ideas for the museum is to call it the Museum of Sanitation and Sustainability, um, to really underscore that point. I think that's actually a great place to leave things for tonight. And we can continue the conversation um, in the reception. And as I said, the book will be on sale there. I just want to say I think this has been a really inspiring evening with the recycling, the composting, the talk of social justice. I think I'll always remember this little piece of paper because that's also very inspiring. Um, and another thing I noticed I just couldn't help with my own research and interest is that neither of you drank your bottled water. So we can put those right back in the fridge and give them to the next guest. 
I brought my own, as you may see. So there are things we can do on our own to make a difference, and I think that really came across tonight, and that comes across when you read Robin's book. Um, I'm going to work on getting you each a private meeting with de Blasio. That's my next project. And um, I just want to thank you both so much for coming tonight and speaking with us. And please, everybody, join us in the reception next door. Thank you. Thank you.